<laughs> We're good. <laughs> now, my howdy, my Kira. My name's Tim, and welcome to the social uh, change panel uh, of the Emerging Futures Summit. Uh, with me, we have Caroline McCaw, uh, Tim Jones, Chessy Cross, and Phil Osborne. Uh, joining us from around New Zealand, uh, but. Tim, uh, I believe you're you're from the UK originally. Is that right? I am, yes. But please don't hold that against me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so again, we're we're based here in New Zealand, uh, beaming out to the world. Uh, thanks to the good folks at YouTube and Google. Uh, we're going to be talking about a, a whole range of things today. But really, uh, what are the mechanisms for social change uh, that we can harness as we think about uh, solving problems? And our expert panels. Uh, are going to bring their experience uh, from both a academic but also a practitioner's background uh, kind of to bear on some of the questions that uh, they've, they've posed and we hopefully will get some questions from you, the participants. So uh, without any further ado, I'm going to let the experts introduce themselves, uh, starting with you, Tim. Fantastic. So, um, yeah, kia koutou. I'm Tim uh, Tim Jones. Um, I guess my my self-imposed brand is I, I call myself the Grow Good Guy. Um, and it took me a while to grow good. I started off, uh, I had a very privileged schooling in the UK. Uh, I went to university and studied medieval history. Um, not medical history. Some people think I say medical history, but that's medieval. Um, with no real intent about what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. Um, and then from there kind of ended up falling into medical device sales um which was quite a, a weird and wacky world and i did that for quite a few years um and then in 2004 uh, found my way to new zealand and i've been here since i'm now a, a kiwi citizen and and uh, yeah loving it living over here i've got my wife and my daughter and so yeah fully fully over here um, but for me, um, like the big, the defining moment in my life was the uh, series of earthquakes that we had here in, in Christchurch in 2010. And that followed pretty quickly in 2012 by the birth of my daughter or, or our daughter. And um, for me, created like a massive subconscious awakening, um, which led me to really challenge who I was and how I'd been created by the various systems and, and bits that I'd been through. Um, and that led me on the journey to discover benefit corporations or B Corps, as they're called. Um, and in yeah late 2015, I ended up uh, started my own business, um, which is now called Grow Good, um, where I help uh, individuals and corporations connect to their higher purpose and and really discover a bit more of a heart around what they're doing. Um, and then on top of that, I'm also currently general manager of Growing Good at Kilmarnock Enterprises, uh, which is a probably New Zealand's biggest um, and most successful social enterprise. Um, yes, yeah, so that that's pretty much keeping me busy and, and I, I guess a little bit about my background. <laughs> Sounds like you're busy. Lots of growing things, Tim. Well, growing good, you know, I think that's at the heart yeah. of what I'm all about. Like, there's, there's enough yeah. not good in the world, so let's go and grow some good in the world. <laughs> yeah, cool, man. That, that's great. All right, uh, Caroline, do you want to go next? Sure. Uh, okay, so I'm a New Zealander, and I've lived in Dunedin for a long time, and I have five degrees, most of them in art, uh, and but deeply connected to the local. So I'm really interested in social practice in many forms uh, and how people connect to each other. Uh, and that's at the base of my teaching too. So I'm a lecturer or associate professor in communication design here at Otago Polytechnic, uh, where we, we have a very user-focused, learner-focused approach. Uh, and we do a lot of, um, well, I, my favorite kind of teaching is project-based learning with our local communities. So as well as learning your subject, you're learning it with uh, other people. So there's, this is kind of a social benefit. There's a social literacy that grows out of learning and uh, the community benefits too. Can so, I ask a quick question, Caroline? Yeah. Is, is, what, what is it about the local thing that gets you excited? Like, is, is there some magic in, in local? Oh, there absolutely is. Um, I was recently, well, I've been traveling around looking at other programs around the world who, who teach social design. And um, I was in uh, Baltimore and I was listening to their projects. Some students giving some amazing pre presentations about what they were doing. And Baltimore is a very different city from Dunedin, which is where I live. Um, and it just really made me realize that 
you can't transfer your local community. You know, they're always going to be really specific to where you live, how you live. And um, and I'm really keen to try and uh, see local good happening so that when you, there's so much that you can grow around you just by, I mean, starting with your very neighbours. Um, and it's totally a magic. There's something I really love about meeting and helping each other. So um, the two projects that I'm working on today, um, well, tomorrow there is a Design for Social Innovation Symposium, which is bringing practitioners from Australia and New Zealand together to meet just out here. Uh, and I'm hosting that. So that's going to be exciting because it will definitely meet new people and new and hear about new practices. But also I had a nice conversation in the hallway recently, uh, like a half an hour ago, with another mum from um, one of my kids' schools. And we were... Uh, hatching a plan to um, to make the school better. Like we were talking about how we really wanted the school to be really respectful of all of the children. It's a very multicultural school. And how uh, we as parents had a responsibility to get in there and, and help them, not just complain in the hallway. So like right. every relationship you have is one where you can contribute. And, and we were just talking about how we could do that. Caroline, I mean, and, and sorry everyone for jumping in with questions or observations, but I, I will do this. But it, it strikes me that that's our first kind of highlight of a, of a challenge or opportunity to actually do some social good, make some social change. Like as simple as just in your local school, talking with a, a fellow parent and going, well, how can we make this better for our kids? Yeah. That, right? Yeah. We, every day there's multiple ways that we can make change happen and it's better together. Yeah, nice. I like that. Better together. It's cool. Um, well, thank you. Uh, Phil, do you want to jump in next? Yeah, sure. So I work um, not with Carol, Carol directly, but in the same institution, soon to be more directly as my our business school here is being incorporated yeah. into uh, the design school at the faculty here, which is an cool. interesting uh, approach to business. And my, my, my journey has been along the very much a traditional business education, um, undergraduate degree and, and master's degree, postgraduate qualifications in business disciplines. But as I've been teaching over the years, um, it struck me that the business methodology wasn't the way to fix the world, I guess, in mm -hmm. terms of... Um, even though it has some things to add, so I was involved very early on on the social entrepreneurship idea. But one of my my disquiets was that maybe the business mentality had contributed to some of the social um, not so good that we were now having to deal with. But as I looked into it, I found there was lots of companies and really cool to hear Tim talk about B Corps, but there was lots of companies that did have a higher social purpose and some of their practices started getting me interested in organisational purpose and social purpose and where they crossed over and what we could, what businesses could learn from communities as well as what communities could learn from businesses, mm -hmm. where up until recently I think the hierarchy has been one way that businesses knew how to do it and 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 so and communities maybe didn't. Um, so I'm very keen to try and wed those two things together, and that's what's sort of drawn me into the design journey. Um, and I've spent sort of the last five years trying to become uh, more able to speak the design language and bring more designers into my practice, or and and also lend some of my practice to designers in the social good area. Um, I've been lucky in Otago Polytechnic, who very innovative about programs and very learner centred, is that we've recently, um, I've been recently involved in developing a new program called Bachelor, Bachelor for Leadership for Change, which we might talk about later on, that actually came out of a lot of these feelings that no one discipline has the answer for the social good question. Well, and it's a thing that came from our, our space panel is that really for these wicked problems uh, that involve humans, we we need the diversity of thought to think differently. And one of the kind of the, the phrases or concepts that came out was we actually need to create a new box. We don't need to just think outside the box. We need to create a whole new box 
Uh, and I feel like for this particular discussion, that's also relevant, is that there are things we can learn from the old catalytic box, but potentially there's a whole new box of goodies that we need to go and explore and, and get back to some of those humanistic tendencies. Well, there's um, many boxes that already exist. Well, that's it. And I, I guess that, that will take us on to our first question. But uh, I don't want to miss out on you, Jesse. Uh, do you want to do a quick introduction? Yeah, so I'm Jesse Cross. Um, I'm in Christchurch, New Zealand. And uh, I currently work for LRTT, which stands for Limited Resource Teacher Training. Um, we're a social enterprise that trains teachers in uh, developing countries. Um, I got here... Uh, via an interesting route. So I studied um, law and science at university in, in Christchurch here um, and, you know, really enjoyed that and started off my career practicing law for a couple of years for a um, top tier commercial firm uh, here in Christchurch. Um, and it was, you know, a really great experience, but kind of similar to what Tim was saying, um, kind of felt the need to to do, do a bit more good and really connect with um, the purpose of what I'm doing a bit more. Um, and that's when I found LRTT earlier this year and um, since then have really enjoyed the process of getting to understand how a social enterprise can work, um, a totally different sort of business model to your traditional business um, that's really driven towards doing doing good and achieving like a purpose and solving a problem is kind of the driving force behind what we do, which is, you know, improving the quality of education for children sort of all over the world. Um, so, yeah, that's me in a nutshell. <laughs> cool. You know what I noticed about you, Jesse, as you, you talked about who you were and the transition, and maybe this is me just projecting, but as you talked about going from being a lawyer to social enterprise, this little smile appeared <laughs> on your face. <laughs> that I don't know if that's, that's, again, me projecting. But I guess, you know, we talked about this uh, last week is the, the value of of doing good and the feeling of that. And that, that's something we want to get into. But uh, let's let's jump into our first big question is, um, and, and you've touched on this, uh, Phil, is you know, what are some of those change models that have been explored and, and why do they work? So we don't need to... Um, necessarily create new boxes there's plenty of boxes to explore but uh, Tim perhaps you can just give us a quick outline of, of what is the social change model uh, what does it mean what does it mean to think social first cool um, I mean I think for me you know where where I guess you know the business world has gone wrong where we've all been you know, we've kind of been sold this big ruse as, as a species that success is all around more money, more things. Um, I was having a coffee with someone today and as he, he called it, it was that um, it's values versus valuables. You know, we've, we've been told that valuables is better than values. Um, it's this constant chasing of tinsel and tinketry rather than just actually being OK with who you are. And um that that's kind of led us you know we're, we're most of us are living on what's called the hedonic treadmill where it's like i have to have a bigger bigger house i need to have a bigger car i need to go on a bigger holiday i need the new phone year on year because otherwise i'm not i'm not complete and so for me that's kind of that's at the heart of where business has gone wrong and um, it's it's this yeah constant telling us that we're not worthy and so that we need to buy more stuff to find our our completeness and so I think that's that for me is like the heart of the change of where we need to get is, you know, at some point in the future that my, my personal view is there will be businesses that lose their mandate to exist because they don't serve humanity. And, you know, when, um, when you say they don't serve humanity, what is it that they don't serve? And, and everyone else, feel free to jump in and help them on this one. <laughs> so um, th there are a series of. You know, there, there are these mega challenges that we're collectively facing as a species. Well, these things haven't just, well, some of them you could argue have turned up by themselves, but, but inequality hasn't just turned up. You know, inequality has turned up because someone in an organization is taking more than they need at the expense of someone else. Mm -hmm. So 
um, you know, poverty hasn't just turned up. Poverty turns up because someone wants to keep you poor so that they can either control you or they can ensure that you don't get to a level where you can compete against them at a certain level. So, you, you know, it's, and it's interesting, we, we were just after the space one, because because of the, my, my latest um, frame I use around this is about three weeks ago, a group of Japanese scientists landed a robot on an asteroid flying in space. Mm. We can do that. We can solve the challenges that we're currently facing as a species. That's my kind of take on it. And so, and, and I think, um, you know, where Carol was talking about the local, you know, this, this to me, I 100% agree, you know, that, that connection to your neighbour, your community, your society, and realising that what you do on a day-to-day -day basis impacts everyone else. And so mm. if your business or what you do as a human is, has externalities that is negatively impacting other humans, why should you be allowed to do that if the only reason you're doing that is to make more money? And I think that's really where businesses has been for the last few hundred years. And, uh, Bill or, or Carrie, you want to jump in, but I, yeah. could someone just define an externality for, for us? Oh, <laughs> okay. So an externality is like a, a, a cost that's not recognized in the costing system. So when we produce, when we produce a good or, or a service, we're really good at, at, at um, at calculating the total good cost it takes us, cost of goods sold that we mm -hmm. that, yeah, but a lot of it like throwing away the rubbish, disposing of the the battery from our computers, um, disposing of the packaging from the supermarket, are not uh, accrued to any direct person, then they actually accrue to the community, and the community has to deal with them. So there, there's something that comes out of the consumption process that no one has factored into the cost of, of building or even quite often in the price of selling it. Mm. Um, yeah, so, so it, adds, it adds waste to the, to the system, really. Would that All be right, a yeah. reasonable one for you, Tim, would that? Yeah, 100% agree. It's like it's, it's this all this output from the business that kind of just gets thrown into society. I think that's the best way to, you know, to, to frame it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and as, as you were talking, I was thinking about whether how did we how did we get to how did we get to this place? Because that was one of my challenges as I as I grew through the business literature and I and I started to think about how do I make organizations. So my, one of my early um Purposes was trying to understand the how to make organizations perform better, whatever that meant. And it involved going back to the early literature to see why they were formed in the first place. And actually the theory of of, of organizations doesn't suggest any of the stuff that we do, that this profit motivation was corrupted mm. at some point by the formation of corporations and the preeminence of shareholders' return on investment. Um, and actually organisation, especially marketing, which is my field, actually at, at its core is, is about improving everybody's lot, you know, that you can't, you can't scam people in the short term. It doesn't, you know, marketing's about relationships and we lost that somewhere along the propaganda model and the, and the, and the, um, and the shareholder model. What, so, one um, observation is, and this is to, to your perhaps kind of, Worldview, Carol, is, is like that. And, and Tim, you, you talk about businesses, but it really starts at, at an individual level, right? Like social yeah. change starts individually and, and relationships between you and those around you. And this is the local aspect, right, Carol? Yeah. And I, I think, like, so within the design thinking model, empathy is the tool that we talk about as how you feel from someone else's shoes. Mm. how to feel from their perspective, look through their eyes and understand how and why people behave in order to change behaviour. But um, I liked, I just want to pick up on one word that Tim said, which is around connection. Like um, I was listening to something on the radio recently because it's Mental Health Week here in New Zealand, and they said that, you know, the antidote to addictions, for example, is connection. It's mm. not like sobriety, it's connection, that we all crave connection. Mm. So and from my perspective as a teacher, I'm, I am, you know, like legitimately employed to teach people about design, but really I just want to teach them how to be a good citizen. 
that this yeah. citizenship is something that's missing in most of our education. Mm. So that, that it comes with responsibility and it comes with um, really good communication skills around connecting with others who are not like you. Mm. So I, I guess a couple of takeaways for our participants is uh, like social change models it strikes me that they're based on this idea of you have to look wider, right? Mm -hmm. You have to you have to think about not only those people around you and the impact that potentially your activity is having on them, but potentially at people on the other side of the city and the the other part of your country and around the world. Yeah. <laughs> around, what yeah. is the impact? And and I, I guess one other observation, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but if you're seeking connection uh, as kind of a, a first port of call uh, in the way that you go about life, it's difficult to uh, like, you know, dump rubbish on people <laughs> if you're connected with them, if you're genuinely yeah. trying to seek connection or, or dump an ex externality on them, right? 100%. 100%. Yeah. I mean, some of the, I, I love watching some of these programs occasionally on TV, like when the CEOs go back to the shop floor. And they've been so disconnected from the enterprise that it's all about spreadsheets and efficiency and improvement. And then they go and meet the human being who's doing the lowest paid job. And they go, ah, oh, right. So mm -hmm. you can't afford healthcare. And oh, I didn't realize that, you know, you work in a really cold environment. And, mm. then, and this is the thing. We're so, you know, the, our metric of success as a society has been all about how much money you have in your account. Mm. predominantly that's what we you know we have the nbr rich list in new zealand like we we, we focus on the top 50 richest mainly guys in mm. new zealand and we go fantastic well done and we don't care about how they got that money or mm -hmm. what they did to make that money or the impact of making that money and i think that's, that's where, the key right tim it's the impact that we, we need to become more aware of yeah yeah and if we start thinking about relationships we start understanding that we're in a network and that we're part of a system and we start becoming aware of the connections, not just individually, but as groups. And that suddenly lifts your perspective to a, to a different level. Like, yes, yeah. it impact, how it impacts on you individually as a result of the system that you're contributing to. So you're, you're, you're almost, um, not forced, but you can't help but notice the connections and the implications from a system's perspective, and then being a good citizen of that system, yeah. and understanding how your role contributes to the overall health yeah. or dishealth, unhealth yeah. of that system becomes easier to understand. I've I've and, got a question here from from the participants. Um, and there's, there's a bit of a theme around laziness that it, people are making this observation is that this is not a, a lazy person's game. Like to, to do social change, it requires you to put some extra energy in, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I think um, it's, it's hard because as soon as you start connecting with the world around you, the people around you, and you become really conscious of the impact of all of your actions, um, it becomes really, really hard to be authentic and follow through on things that you notice are having a negative impact. Um, but I think it also that can become quite paralyzing and then you decide, well, I'll do nothing then. So I think it's it's best to kind of think, okay, like this is going to be hard, but I'm just going to break it down into little chunks and I'm going to make small changes in my life where I can and keep growing those small changes and eventually that will amount to a really massive impact. So potentially we can get back to this question of, of the, the social change models uh, that have been explored and, and we can get down to some examples of what's working and how they're working. Whew, big question. Big question. I, think, I, think social, I think social change has been going on with a whole bunch of um, uh, coexisting models that haven't been joined together mm. a, a lot of the time yeah. and that Maybe one of the things that has brought us together over the last um, sort of five or so years is this idea or a common language around sustainability, perhaps, mm. that is that has drawn a lot of these models together and we've started to to borrow, like obviously the social enterprise model, the social entrepreneurship model has been applied quite vigorously in the last few years um few years 
of, of this idea, this idea of using business ideas around efficiency and lean canvases and and um, startup methodologies has been started to be applied to social problems. But I know that Caroline will be able to add some stuff around social change and social change models have been happening could, locally could we for just, a long time. Could, could we have just an example? And I think Jesse potentially, you know, what you're doing is a great example of yeah. social entrepreneurship in action, right? Yeah, so um, LRTT started with a small bunch of teachers from the UK who went to Uganda and um, started working with about 25 Ugandan teachers back in 2011. Um, they acknowledged that there was a real shortfall in um, quality teacher training there. And so there were, we were getting really like large class numbers and lots of students going to school. Um, but then when they were there, they weren't actually learning when because the teachers didn't have the skills to be able to teach them really effectively. So um, the, the founders of LRTT kind of acknowledged, OK, this is a problem in Uganda. It's a problem in many, many countries around the world. Um, and so they went about trying to start fixing that problem by taking teachers from the UK, the US, Australia and New Zealand um, and sending them during their summer holidays on these teacher training fellowships to work with the local teachers in these countries and provide training opportunities that they wouldn't otherwise have. So what you've got there is you've recognised that there's a resource, which are these teachers who have sort of about six weeks off each year um, during their summer break and they are naturally really socially connected um, and driven individuals because they're teachers. They've chosen a really, you know, great career path um, that already gives back and they want to do that more. So they go overseas and they share their skills and that grows their impact even further. Um, yeah, so. Where, and, and the, the money, where, where's the money coming from to drive this, this flywheel of change? So the teachers from um, Australia, New Zealand, the UK and the US who go on these fellowships, they pay a program fee and that covers the costs of them going on the fellowship. So their food, their accommodation, their training, everything. And that sponsors the in-country teachers to be able to attend that training at no cost to them. So breaks down that barrier um, for the teachers in the countries we work with. And yeah, that program fee also pays for our running costs for LRTT, which obviously we have to keep to a real minimum to make it all work, which is often a bit of a struggle, but uh, it's definitely doable. And it just means that you focus every dollar on the impact that you have um, rather than on anything unnecessary or extra. Fantastic. But d does anyone have any other examples that they want to throw in around the social enterprise model? I think, I mean, one that I guess, you know, is taking the world a bit by storm is the B Corporation model. There's there's sort of two and a half thousand and growing um, B Corps because LRT, uh, you're, you're a B Corps in the UK. Yeah. 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 Um, and I think, you know, more and more people are realizing that the way we've been running the show isn't working for them. Like one of my catchphrases is, you know, the system is killing you, your family and the planet. Yet you willingly sign up and go to work every day to perpetuate that. But more and more people are kind of seeing the ruse and kind of going, actually, you know, I am contributing to some of these externalities. And I actually don't really, you know, 70% of people in the Western world dislike their job. They're disengaged, yet they continue to turn up to take the money. And I think more and more people are realizing that and are seeking out these opportunities of businesses that do good. Um, and once you connect to that, once you, I mean, Jesse and I have been on a very similar journey. Like once you've connected to doing good, you look back on your former life where you were basically taking the money and you just go like, how did I even, like, how? Like, why was that even a thing? Like, why can't everyone else see that that's not cool? A, um, a question I, I have, Tim, is because I'm very mindful is that potentially it may be perceived that um, it's a privilege to be able to think this way. And that there, there are a few questions coming up again in the feed around, you know, oh, but is, is this possible for everyone to think from a, you know, if you don't have all the resources and you're starting out from scratch and, you know, you live in a, a small city somewhere uh, in a developing country, mm. can, can you do this? Can you be use a social change model from the get go? I think you can. I think I think you have to. I think if you're that close to the you know the end point of what we've all kind of been creating in in the privilege world, then um, there's no point trying to go on the same path that we've all been on. You know, you might as well start. Mm -hmm. I mean, 
but it is a challenge. I was having this conversation um, with someone this morning, you know, he, um, and he's working with really uh, disadvantaged communities in New Zealand. And, and as he says, you know, when you can't put food on the table, do you care about whether the food scraps go in the recycling bin or the food <coughs> bin or the compost bin or the bin mm. bin? Like, it's not mm. even on your radar. And I, and I, that for me, though, is is where, you know, I want to help try and build more purpose-led individuals in, in my world so that we can eliminate those people being on those at, at that level. Like, you know, we shouldn't let any other human be suffering. Mm. Um, but yeah, in terms of, um, again, I think, you know, Caro is 100% correct. Like, look, look at your local community. What can you do to affect change locally? You know, that's what we need to do. That's what we, that's what we have to do. Um, because that's where you're going to create really good impact. Yeah, Caro, have, have, have you got any examples? That. Sorry, I no. think it's about remembering that what the aspiration is, is that we are talking from a privileged position where mm -hmm. our aspiration has been corrupted to the growth model that um, Tim was talking about before. And if, if, if you're thinking about on a local level, what's your aspiration? It's as Caro said, how can I make my school better? How can I make it better for my brother, my sister, my children? Um, and it doesn't require resources, it requires conversations um, and empathy. And the, the design thinking model doesn't talk about... It doesn't the, talk about your neighbours. <laughs> I know, but it, but it also doesn't talk about the outcome being profitable, you know? No, that's right. You know, so, so I think yeah. there are, you know, the design thinking model is opening us up to those. It, it has some flaws. But it also has some opportunities yeah. that allow us to break away from I'm only doing this so that I can get an income to feed my family. There's other ways of, of, of doing that. Mm. And I, I think if you're um, in a position where you're watching this um, this live stream, then you've obviously been fortunate enough to get an education and here you are today and now you're interested in this, which is amazing. So I guess going forward, if you are wanting to, if you see a problem and it seems seems huge in your community, think about, okay, what small thing can I do to contribute to fixing this problem? It might be that you might want to start up a, a small business that distributes food more efficiently or distributes waste food, you know, that's still good to eat or something like that. And I think it's thinking through, if you're going to try and solve a problem, think about the whole system and everything that contributes to the problem and how you can potentially work towards solving it. Well, oh, I really love that, Jesse. And and I wonder, Caro and, and Phil, uh, whether you want to jump in there around just that, you know, I guess the systems thinking required to do change. You know, yeah. how, do you, how would someone start to think about the life cycle of, of an activity that they do? Um, I'm just going to talk again about uh, the conversation I had in the hallway at five o'clock. Yeah. yeah. Um, with this other mum from school. Uh, and how uh, we the, the school used to have a breakfast club or like a, a before school care where if you had to go to work early, you could drop your kids before the teachers got there. And that's fallen apart. So we were talking about, well, I live across the road from the school, so I'm really just wasting an hour of my time in the morning that I could be just helping other families at school. And I'm really happy to, to set something up. I can't always do it myself because I travel. But between us, we can do something. So we can share the load of something that seems, which is a big deal to some parents, and being able to provide breakfast for kids. Like I can easily take some breakfast cereal in, and I don't have to tell the school about it. Yeah. Uh, but between us, you know, if there's five mums that can do that, you know, suddenly we're changing, we're actually changing the learning environment for a group of children who don't have control over their situation. So mm. it's a pretty small effort. To make really it practical, right, Caro? Yeah. Like, I think yeah. that's what I'm, I'm picking up from, from all this, is that, you know, one, one kind of, I guess, um, romanticism of, of, like, big gnarly problem solving is, like, you know, we're going to go solve that big problem, we're going to climb that mountain, but actually, when it comes to social change, it's doing a really small thing, like taking a box of cereal to school or finding a better way to distribute food. Um, yeah. Tim, are, are there any examples that you can think of, like really practical things? Um, I mean, I guess, you know, with my Kilmarnock hat on, um, you know, we work uh, here in Christchurch with individuals that have been marginalised by the education and um, employment 
system, I guess, or, or, or through, you know, lack of opportunities through discrimination um, because they've got perceived uh, intellectual disabilities. And, you know, just something as simple as giving someone um, hope and um, telling them that they are worthy and that they have, that they are, you know, they're okay as a human and that they can do something. You know, that is, that's at the very core of what we do at Kilmarnock. So we provide education and employment opportunities for people that, like I say, would, would ordinarily not get them. And just the very fact of, of them knowing that we exist and it's a place that they know they can come and it's safe and someone cares about them mm -hmm. is, that's the crux of what we do. You know, we wrap around that, the, by giving them a job and health and well-being and and da da da, a sense of purpose and community and da da da. But it, the very essence of what we do is just letting someone know that it's going to be okay and that we've got your back. Um, and again, that, to me, that comes back to that connection and 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 you know, we're all we're all human beings. We're all we've all got maybe you know, for my peer group, if I make it to ninety, probably you know, my kid, my daughter, she'll probably make it to one hundred and fifty. Who knows with medicine? But at the end of the day, we're all just trying to get through our time here, have a good time and survive you know on this spinning blue and green disc in the middle of the universe <laughs> i love it <laughs> one a couple of questions from our participants um and the, the first one is does every social enterprise need to be profitable so this one that you've just given an example of tim mm -hmm. is that is that profitable it is um and, but it's interesting you know, cause, Historically, charities or Kilmarnock itself has been described as a not-for-profit, and the very as soon as you you know I'm, I'm all about the framing and the language that you use. As soon as you say we are not-for-profit, it kind of indicates that you're okay not making money. So Michelle, who is our amazing CEO, she she reframed it and said, "No, we're a not-for-loss. Mm. So we make money. It's just what we do with the money that's different." And it has created headaches when we've been looking for investment from uh, the local banks, for instance, where they kind of look at our uh, look at our books and go, you don't make money. And it's like, no, we do make money. It's just that we reinvest all the money back into the business to create social change and, and, and positive impact. And I, I firmly believe that there is a better way of running the world than the current financial system. There, there kind of has to be. And that's where, you know, the little Japanese robot on the week right comes into play. Like there has to be a better way that we can organize all this. But in the current narrative, the current framework that we have, it's it's like being on the um, on the airplane. You know, when they say put your own life jacket on first before helping others. If you yeah. are not financially sustainable as a business, you are going to become reliant on other people around you for you to do your mission. So my personal take is in the current and the current framework, you have to be sustainable. And if that's mm -hmm. if you're if you're constantly relying on handouts, grants, donations, where you're fighting against other organizations with potentially a very similar mission to yours, I, I just don't think that's good use of your time and effort. And I think that's right. where Kilmarnock has nailed that that model. So I'm I'm gonna throw this potentially controversial question in. Is, uh, a few people have asked, can you think of a really cool social enterprise, like one that from perhaps the current box and capitalistic thinking that people would go, yeah, that's really cool. It's a great example of a cool business, but also doing good. Um, there's this really cool one here that started in Christchurch called Etique, um, which was founded by a um, scientist. Um, her name's Brienne, and she basically uh, waged war against the cosmetic industry because she hates all of the single-use plastic bottles that you create when you use your shampoo and then you throw it in the bin and everything. So she's um, formulated these really, really high-quality, great, like, solid beauty bars that are shampoo conditioner cleanser moisturizer soaps everything yeah, they're great they're yeah, really good that's such good yeah. products yeah and so she's she's nailed it because she's made an awesome product she's gotten rid of all of the single-use plastic um all of her packaging is biodegradable she's used her own skill set because she trained as a like studied science as a chemist um so you know that's just an example of seeing seeing a problem right you're seeing all this waste that's totally unnecessary and you're thinking, okay, how can we rethink the way that we do this completely and come up with an, a solution that consumers are going to want um, and it's going to be really good for the environment? And, and, 
and just really interesting that she does, that ethic doesn't have to present itself as a social enterprise either, yeah, yeah, even yeah. though it is a social enterprise. Yeah. You know, exactly. Yeah, it's a really good point, Phil. Mm. And I think yeah. that for me, that 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 has to be, it will be, and it has to be the future of business. You know, yes. I think you you look at where we're at now, and most businesses to date have been extractive in their business model, like we, we and that's on a human capital level, financial, and the planet some businesses now are moving into the look we're still extractive but we're doing some good to try and mitigate that and that's okay like it's a start but the the business of the future in my mind is going to have to be regenerative it's going to have to be we're going to leave the planet in it like our existence is making the planet a better place mm -hmm. and there is no extraction and i think someone like atik is kind they're they're kind of there mm -hmm. you know there or thereabouts you could there's maybe you know tiny little bits you could say hey you know what about this what about that but in general the whole concept is like the more you use our product there is absolutely potentially like zero impact on the planet mm. yeah and i think it's really interesting just to loop back to that question about not for profit versus for profit actually what that tells you is about the organization's purpose not their operating system right yeah. so not for profit doesn't mean I don't make profit. It means I don't set out to make profit. Yes. In yep. fact, I'm trying to return stuff to to the system that I operate in. So that's a nice mindset change. It's not it's not um, it's not an antithesis of hey I have to operate in a different way. It just means my purpose isn't to make extra cash to give to my shareholders. So um, which go, loops back to your um, restor restoration model rather than your extractive model. Mm. So we've we've got a question here uh, in our in our for our for our panelists around you know I guess we've used this with what is the ecology of doing good? So what you know if if we're not making we're not creating value in the sense of dollars, uh, what is the value that we're creating through this alternative way of thinking? I think we're just coming back to acknowledge that um, money is made up like that's something that humans created to facilitate like trade of goods and services in a more efficient way. And the way our market is at the moment is it's fixated on money and making money for the sake of money. What we need to do is come back and realize why were we earning that money in the first place? Oh, it was to, to be able to help out other humans. Um, and when you do that, you realize that actually helping humans makes you feel a lot better than earning money. Um, and that's kind of the, the it's, it's circular, right? Like you, you focus again Business on helping again, people. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah it, you know, it's totally circular. You focus on doing good, connecting with other humans, and then you have a positive impact. And, you know, the money becomes kind of the this, this secondary thing that helps facilitate all that, but it's not the focus. And, and it's really, it's a really, it's a really interesting measurement problem from an academic point of view. When you put your hat on, we've defaulted to money because it's easy to measure. Mm. It's hard to measure happiness. It's hard to measure health. Mm. So we say, well, how much does it cost? Because we can know what we can count the dollars. Yeah. But as soon as you understand that values and value are different things, mm. you start to crack the egg. You know. 100%. And I, and I think more and more people are, certainly, you know, it, it, I guess, you know, my, my cultural lens is, is this Western democratized world where we've been told that, you know, bigger is better and more money equals more success and so on and so forth. But, you know, a question that I pose in, in purpose workshops that I run is, can anyone tell me who the richest man in America was in 1968? No, not, not many people. If I've, not, never had, I've never had anyone. But does everyone remember Martin Luther King? Yeah. Yeah. 1968 Great. civil rights movement like doing good like, is real legacy you know no one know no one cares who's got the money yet we're so fixated on that and i think that is that's where this ecology of doing good is is transitioning it's you know on the human level carrie you absolutely nailed it like what we actually need is connection but we we trade connection for money for the goods that we buy to try and get that connection and it's ne you never <laughs> you never win you can never fulfill yourself. But it, it's, and it's a really inefficient process, right, Tim? Because yeah. we create all these costs. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. The whole the whole modern uh, consumer society is predicated on your self worth being at zero. Because mm. the lower you respect yourself, the more you try and fill that void by buying things that people look at you and go, "Oh, wow, look, Tim's got a lovely blazer on. 
oh, isn't that fantastic? He must have cost lots of money. Oh, he must be a good human because he can spend lots of money on nice clothes. Instead yeah. of us all just going, do you know what? I don't need anything. I'm happy. I'm content. Mm -hmm. And so this is, I guess, for me, like that regenerative business model is I genuinely want to be out of business in five years. If I'm still having to do purpose workshops in five years' time, I failed and we're probably on completely the wrong track as a species. In five years' time, I want to either just be retired and reading books and philosophizing and just doing cool stuff, or there'll be some other challenge that we can start solving. And I think I'm pretty sure it's that 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 what we do down here. And there's a really <laughs> interesting thing. That there's a really interesting thing that's been going on in my head as we've been talking about it. And I'm gonna I'm gonna throw it on you to talk about Maui Studios when we okay. do. But there's a difference between doing good and being good. And you can mm. do good by being good. And I think that the reason I'm going to um, throw that over to Kara because she knows more about the case study is this is probably an example of accidentally doing good by being good is where yeah. I was going to go from that. Is. Okay. I'll, well, I'll just talk a little bit about a group of students who were working together. They kind of found each other. And they actually, two of them were cousins, but they found each other in the course that they were studying here at the Polytechnic and Design. and they. Um, you know, they really wanted to, they were Māori students who really wanted to, um, they wanted to bring together the stories their grandfather told them with Dragon Ball Z. They really wanted to somehow bring these two kinds of systems together and tell good stories. That was their real passion. And uh, they, did, we, they got matched up with lots of community projects. And they really grew out of finding their place in these community projects. They, they, really, they really thrived in this environment. Um, and they they went on to set up a business, um, and they've been in business now for five years. And they now um, contract and employ like forty to sixty people at any one time. So that there's the, in their passion, they found something that really had a need. Um, and I think the the thing is, you might not be going out of your way to to change the world, but you might change the world anyway. Mm. <laughs> and there's something in your heart that changes the world, not necessarily in your in the way that you do it. Like we can't really teach how to do that. We didn't set out a, to go about teaching those students how to how to change the world, but nevertheless, they are changing the world. That's really um, cool. Mm. Yeah, they were. They, there's, I, I put a slide up, yeah, yeah so that so you can see the kind of like this is what some of their more recent character design, and there's a website there if you want to look up some of their work. But they've actually moved from being designers to radically thinking about their business model. So they want to have a business model that is um, uh, deeply connected to their cultural practice. So in the beginning, it was their drawing and their storytelling that was their cultural practice, and now they see that they are leaders that they have a leadership role to play in developing a business model that is really true to their community. So they would not call themselves social entrepreneurs. Mm. They would call themselves Māori designers, young Māori designers, trying to work with young Māori to tell good stories. Mm. But the impact is they're actually, actually they're supporting 40 to 50 young designers in their practice, and they're growing a practice in a really unique way. So I, again, it's a local story. Um, it might be similar to uh, um, someone starting out at the farmer's market and developing a really great farm. I mean, this is just like a kind of, like it doesn't need to be a yeah. design story. Mm. It's definitely a way that you do it yeah. and having passion. Mm. When, you, when you talk about the way that you do it, Caro, because I think this is perhaps where people what is it specifically about the way? Is it simply just being aware of this idea of are all the things that we're doing, are they all collectively doing more good than bad? Is that a simple way to kind of ask the question of, you know, is the activity I'm doing and going to create more good than bad? Uh, it's also about seeing yourself in a system because yeah. it's not just you. You are always sure. connected. Yeah. So what is the system within you which you work and what is the impact it has on others? To always ask that of everything you do. Yeah. So if that system is at some point negative, stop doing it. But if you can see there's a really positive impact on others, and this is how these students grew through their education, is that they really found 
that by doing work Oh, I think we uh you're doing the right thing. Keep doing it. Yeah. And and I guess that's 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 one of the things that we're finding is that the young people that are coming to this institution to look for education are quite often coming with a desire to be good, yeah? And not and not knowing how to ground that and we're giving them pathways to do that that uh, to save, uh, I guess, jumping to towards a sort of a little bit of a, a, a thing for us is that it's post-disciplinary. It doesn't sit in any one of our boxes that we have here. Is that if you come with a desire to learn, we can give you some frameworks to apply that learning. Or we can help you meet people that yep. will help you grow. Yeah. So a second group of another group of students that I just want to mention here because I think they relate to the ecology of doing good. Uh, is a two product design students who have been working with the Yellow Eyed Penguin Trust. So the Yellow Eyed Penguin is the rarest penguin in the world. It lives here on our beaches. There's, uh, and there's some really good people, some zoologists working hard to try and help them stay alive, basically. We're down to 255 breeding pairs, so it's, they're really on the brink right now. And these one student in particular, uh, he comes from a farm and he loves human-centered design, but he's kind of frustrated that it's called human-centered design because he really likes the design for the well-being of animals and, and primarily from a farm, which is his background. And he worked on the this project with the Yellow-Eyed Penguin Trust and a couple of other students to help develop, uh, way, in his case, weigh stations so that they could weigh the penguins without disturbing them so they knew the kind of health of the penguins as they were going through their breeding season, which is about half the year, actually. Half the year they're either breeding, they're laying eggs, their eggs are hatching, or the, the birds are molting and they can't go near them. So to work with penguins, he first had to work with zoologists. And he's got this lovely story of using human-centered design beyond humans, you know, but he had to work with humans to get to the birds. Because the whole Penguin system, centered design. Yeah, yeah. well, it's all it's all related. We we can't Sorry, separate yeah. humans mm. from the environment we're in. We might it's think of ourselves point. first, yeah. but we really have to think of the whole system. And zoologists mm. incredibly well meaning they know a lot about penguins, but they weren't doing things in a penguin centric way because they didn't have the skills to do that. So by working as a team, they a whole lot of, of things came out of that. And actually the team needs to be bigger. And so working together, I'm sorry for keeping on coming back to that, but in oh, a disciplinary way, <laughs> yeah. it's always going to be better. We need to work as a team. We have to have share some goals. We've got to be out to help others. And and all of a sudden, more that the change is incrementally bigger and better. And I don't I don't touch money. I'm not interested in business. I'm really fortunate to have a job where I can just help other people learn and help other people through their learning. And animals. I guess you, you recognise, Caro, is that there are other people in the wider team at Otago Polytechnic that their their thing is around sustainable business. And yeah. they, they and that's the power of, of what I guess you're saying, right? Is that yeah. and I think for the participants that were with us on the space uh, panel and if you haven't watched the space panel, go and check it out because the same themes are coming up, is that working together with a diverse team uh, to think about things in a different way, like Kara's just given the example of uh, a student working with zoologists to kind of change the way they think about problem solving uh, <clears throat> with that real drive to do good, uh, mm -hmm. creates this, this wonderful opportunity uh, to, to do this this activity in a, in a, in a better way. Um, I'd just like to echo that really quickly, you know, at yeah. Kilmarnock, you know, we, we, like I say, most of our employees in, in sort of the factory component part of the, of the enterprise have just been told that, you know, literally they're dumb, they've got nothing to offer, your life is going to be sitting at home watching TV for the rest of your life, and you should be grateful that you're getting that. And yet the, the amount of input that they give to our health and safety program to just basically hacking our systems to do things more effectively and more efficiently whereas you know 
a, a large number of our staff have autism or Asperger's. You know, they have unique skills and genius that we can, you know, liberate and bring to our business to make it better and, and more efficient and more healthy and more um, sustainable for all of us by recognizing exactly that, that diversity of everyone. You know, everyone has a voice and everyone should should be listened to. Um, and I think you're 100 percent, you Karen's 100 percent right. You know, we, we've been living in isolation from the planet around us through the, and, and you know echoing Jesse's comment, you know, through this monetary lens. And as long as you're making money, it's all good. Don't worry about, you know, just keep your blinkers on and away you go. And I think that's where I see the next generation already thinking differently. And that's where I have a lot of hope. Yeah, and, and just adding to that and to acknowledging and using the resources around you. Um, so some of you may be living in, you know, completely different environments to us, but all of you will have people around you with skills identify them, talk to them, connect with them, identify problems, focus on them and collaborate and you'll be able to solve them. Um, and I think that's that's something, just don't forget that you actually all have incredible potential and just, you know, talk to people around you and, and utilise it. And Caro, this, this gets back to the human-centred design process, but I guess one of the kind of the magic, I think about these as three magic keywords is, is you know, starting that that ideation process of how might we do this differently how might we think about this problem in a in a slightly different way like how might we make sure that the kids at the local school uh have breakfast in the morning and how might that then change the the learning environment as you've talked about i, I feel like all it, it really takes and this is for the participant is to be curious and open-minded about how might you solve a problem but not at any cost mm. but whilst doing good yeah and and to me like doing good is a really strong emotional feeling w would you agree with it like you know if you're doing good or you're doing bad uh, and look, i think i, I agree and, and and that's that idea of understanding it's not wrong but it, it's part of the package that we bring as humans as a way of thinking and that by talking to someone else you can break free from that dominant logic that's maybe keeping your blinkers on um, and having a conversation and being empathetic um, to see a different perspective can help you be good in a different way that you weren't expecting and this sometimes it's just little things mm. like i can everybody can do something like i can do that i could contribute in this small way yeah. and if you have enough people thinking that way you can change the world yeah. love it i mean my, i guess a comment on this question and it is a really good book i'd recommend for all the participants called a more beautiful question i'm pretty sure is the title and it's all about this how do we how do you make sure you ask the right question to change things that that kind of upset you or you look at and, and challenge but i think the key the key question we need um, particularly, you know, the, the, the younger generations to be asking is why? Why mm. do you do it this way? Why, why, are, you know, why have you been doing that? You know, and, and thinking about, you know, is the way we're doing it creating the outcomes that we all want and we all need? And I think that's the, the you know, that's the crux of the purpose question. Like, why me? Why am I here? Why mm. am I, you know, why am I alive? Why am I a human being or whatever, you know? Like, getting to that question and challenge the status quo, because that's how we're going to change. That's how we're going to get the, the system change that we need. So I, I, one question that's come from one of the participants is, you know, how do, what, what have you seen work really well around kind of raising awareness around this way of thinking? Can you think of any examples that uh, have worked and could be translated to another, you know, locale? Well, I think uh, I can put my marketer's hat on and, and and we can always, a lot of us in the marketing trade are looking for that magic bullet. But you know what we all come back to is word of mouth is stronger than anything that we can um, invent or connect to. Mm -hmm. So you need to talk to people about what you're doing. Maybe a social media platform can give somewhere that they can go and look afterwards. But if you're talking to people and having meetings, and I mean like community meetings, mm. inviting people along. Connection, right, Phil? Yeah. Connection. Is that, is yeah, that, that, and, and, and that there is no magic bullet, you know. The, the one thing about Facebook is that what it's done is it's, it's 
it's provided the technology for the campfire that we've always had. It's just a bigger campfire now, you know? So if you go back to the campfire and get people sitting around telling the stories, yeah. telling your story, telling your purpose, that per the person you talk to will go and tell two or three other people. Yeah. Um, you can't, you can't break, you can't break the traditional storytelling mode to get, yeah. to get it out there. I think. Yeah. Powerful st storytelling and conversations. Mm sharing yeah. those stories yeah and if you've if you've got a great story you know like if you are trying to solve a problem and that's genuinely what you're trying to do to make the world a better place in your small way that's going to be an awesome story that people want to hear and people will hear it they'll get excited and they'll share it and that's that's what we find at lrtt like all of the teachers who go on our fellowships they blog about it they put it all over social media they come back they talk to teachers at their school they spread the word because they've had a life-changing experience and they want to share it with people um so i think if you're doing things for genuinely the right reasons then it will almost you know sell itself in a way yeah 100 percent agree you know um doing good is infectious and contagious mm. um you know we see that at kilmarnock we run tours so people can come in and and, and see around the, you know, around what we do and they all leave just like shell shocked going oh my word like that is just so amazing and they all just kind of go and think about how they can go and do something and for me you know with my kind of purpose hat on it's it's like we are having the best party on the street and everyone wants to go to the best party so yeah. do good do amazing things and people just want to go well hang on that party's pretty cool like the music sounds awesome and the people like seem to be having a great time <laughs> and that's kind of what we need to be doing you know <laughs> that's great um i like that so there we go. Uh, you, you need to create uh, social change by having the best party the best on party. the street. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the nice way to think about it, uh, actually, is just go about creating a business that looks like a great party. Mm. I'll be, I'll be using that. Doesn't annoy your neighbours with loud music? Yeah, <laughs> but they'll, they'll, be there. they'll be there anyway. Oh, cool. <laughs> they'll be there. Love it. Okay, um, I'm, I'm, I'm weary of time. Um, We've got one question that I, I kind of want to end on is you know, how might uh, you know, our participants use their experience and, and background to, to really get into the, the social change space? And I, I think what we'll, we'll use this, as, as I said to you before we got started, is I'd, I'd like you to each kind of just take a little bit of time to talk about you know, what problem would you Solve. If you were embarking on this Emerging Future Summit for the next 10 days with a group of people that you didn't really know yet, what social change problem uh, or lens would you take to this? And Tim, I'm, I'm going to throw you in the deep end. Oh, thanks, mate. I'm going to think, looking at my own experience, you know, I mean, my, my degree, like I say, was in medieval history. So that doesn't really give you much basis in theory to go into social change. But having said that, you know, recognizing you know having studied history and seen the cycle the cyclical nature of humanity and how we treat each other and what we've done and you know mm. uh, the different various ruling empires that we've had over millennia um but also i think for me history uh, you know and i think the arts it's interesting that you know the business school is kind of linking with an art school in in Dunedin there um that critical thinking that's that's where we we you know we the art of debate the art of critical thinking the art of of just questioning and and considering that you might be wrong um is something that was removed from the curriculum in sort of like i think it was in the during the prussian empire so sort of late 1700s early 1800s you know it's like we we don't want people to challenge and think and so i think whatever you bro whatever your background whatever your education like get into critical thinking and just ask like so why do we do that how are we doing that what's the outcome meant to be you know that just that level of thinking i think that that's what i've bought for me in terms of the social challenge i think you need to go with what's passionate for you like for, for me my, where where i spend the majority of my time in, you know in my own business is helping people who basically were like me and jesse who were stuck in the system who've realized that actually I don't want to be in the system, but I've got so many sunk costs in the system, I don't know how to get out. Like that was the thing that appealed to me because because I'd, I'd been on that journey, I speak the language and I know what people are going through. And mm -hmm. that would be my advice is like, pick the challenge that you get fired up about. Because if you've got that passion, that's where the purpose comes. And, and you know, as I sort of say to people, willpower is finite. 
if you're trying to solve something that you're kind of, nah, look, you know, it's kind of okay, but, I, you know, you know, but if you're, you know, it's like the the anecdote you hear of the mum who flips the the, the the object that's trapped the child. Like if your sense of mission and purpose is so deep, that pulls you and you are unstoppable. And so you have to find that thing, that the thing that keeps you awake at night. And, and that's going to be different for every individual. But, you know, coalesce with the other people that share that thing. You have that diverse group. You've got the people that you care about fixing something. You are unstoppable. Great answer, Tim. It's uh, it's an A plus. <laughs> <laughs> Carol and, and Phil, I don't mind if you if you want to tag team on this one or if you want to do it individually. Look, it's really interesting because you 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 posed this sort of pre, and I was wondering, is there something that um, if I embarked on something tomorrow, what would it be? And I actually just reflected on my day, and my first comment is have a look around you and see if there's something that is annoying you or it's like the, mm. the, the, uh, the stone in your shoe. And for me, today it has come up uh, that I've been really aware of gender inequality in the, uh, around, around me. And I have um, two young daughters and I, and I think about what world do I want to bring them into? Mm. And I worry at the moment that they're still coming into a world that wasn't so different from their mother. Yeah. You know, 30 years ago. And so what can I do as an, I'm thinking at the moment, what can I do as an advocate for gender equality from my position as a, and we've used the word privilege a little bit today, from a white male privileged position, why haven't I done something about fixing this before? So that's something that I'm, that I'm really living with at the moment, it might not be the one that's right for everybody who's watching, but it was my stone in my shoe today that it was bugging me. And, and that relates to, to Tim's thought around what's that little burning fire, right? What's the thing yeah. that you're like, oh man, that's irritating. The stone, I like the stone in the shoe because it's a different way yeah. of, of thinking about it. Um, Caro. Oh, I'm just going to take a slightly different position and and say, like, be deeply local, what's happening near you, mm. which is what, like Phil said, but for me, it is to um, start that breakfast club. Mm. Nice. Like it's, it's something I can do. Yeah. It's not a huge issue, It's not, <coughs> but it's a local one, and it's something I can do, an hour of my day, and if I find some other mums who can help, we, we can do it. We we lost you. We've we've lost Caro midstream. Oh no! <laughs> it was it was good. I I think just to to finish off what Caro was was saying, and uh, you know, again, take really practical step, right? Um, take a really practical, hyper local step, and you don't have to go change the world. You can just if if all of us did one thing, right? All of us. That cumulative action would make a massive difference in the world. Uh, Jesse, do you want to do you want to jump in there? Yeah, sure. So I really like what Phil was just saying about the um, the stone in his shoe. Um, I think the oh, are we are we all good? Yeah. Okay. So the the stone in my shoe at the moment is like what that that question earlier in this um, webinar about. Uh, well, is making social change really just something that people in a position of privilege can do? Um, that's really, really hard to swallow, but probably extremely accurate. Um, and I think, how do we how do we get through that? I think the key to it is is education. Like, if if we can make a lot more equality through education throughout the world. Um, the standards of living will lift. That's 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 what happens if you improve education. Living standards lift. So that's that's kind of the the thing that I'm really passionate about is education. And um, if I was doing this weekend, I'd be looking at um, you know what are other ways like we've got what LRTT is doing. What are other ways that we can lift the standards of education so that every child has that that equal opportunity to um, care about social change and be able to implement it in their local area. Love it. Caro, I think we've we've got you back. Do you want to? Where are, are you? Are you there? Oh, I think you're on mute. Is that oh, better? Yeah, you're back. 
Okay, sorry about that technology glitch. It's okay. Um, not sure where you lost me, but we, we lost you. basically part way through you getting really excited about solving this really simple problem, and and I summarised by saying, what what Caro is saying is, you don't have to solve the giant problem. Um, take a really small local action, and cumulatively, it can make a big difference. Yeah, that that sounds spot on. Thanks, Tim. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, it is, and I think it's a lot. It's about having conversations and knowing people. Mm. And actually, but actually, doing something, you yeah. know, like doing mm. something, doing and using an hour of your day to do the breakfast club, and then maybe finding someone else who can do it when you're not there. And then yeah. suddenly you've got a breakfast club running for three months. Mm. Yeah, and try things. Try things. Don't yeah. just think about them. There's a really good um, TEDx talk by a guy called Derek Sivers, and he talks about. Um, and he references a, a guy at a dance party or like, like at, a, a, at a festival. And yeah, right. the, the, the initial guy goes out and he's just having a time of his life and he's dancing. But he says, mm -hmm. you know, to start a movement, the first guy is important, but it's the second and third people that are actually more important because they legitimize the movement. Yeah. But we still need that first person. And, and I think it's right, you know, wh whether your first piece of action is right or wrong, just do something. Yeah. And then, you know, assess, look at your impact. Was there any unintended consequences of me doing good? Yes or no? And then you can kind of, you know, fine tune it until you end up on the right track. But just start doing something. Mm. Yeah. 100%. Prototypes, um, whatever you want to call them, we can use some business language around it. Prototypes, you know, um, minimum viable products, all these things require you to do something first. Try it. Take action, right? Yeah. yeah. One, one question that's come in from the audience, and I, I think we'll leave it after this, is, um, what are what are some of the consequences of of doing social good, both the the negative and the positive? I think the positive is 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 perhaps obvious, uh, but is there any downside to this way of thinking? Um, one downside, I guess, is trying to make it work in the world we live in, which is where money is still really important, um, mm -hmm. and it's kind of the way our society is structured. Um, so that's that's not necessarily a downside. It's just something that you have to kind of overcome and you have to uh, deal with. And it means you have to be innovative and you have to come up with a structure that can make you money so you can sustain what you're doing and keep doing good. Um, and it's not impossible. It's been done. We've talked about lots of examples um, on here, but it just requires a bit of creative thinking. Love I think it. there's one, one downside is to just make sure that you're not doing good two people or two things that you're doing it with people and it. with things yeah. so it, it can be you can get very passionate about trying to fix things from your own perspective mm. um, because you think that you know the best way but if you're doing it with people rather than two people or two things mm. you'll very much quickly be made aware of of the downside of things it's great yeah. Phil. And Carol, I guess that's the empathy aspect of, of the process that participants, we're going to be working through over the next 10 days. But Caro, do you want to talk about yeah. the empathy side? Yeah, so the, I think in terms of empathy, I'm, I'm going to go back to that metaphor of a conversation. So when you're, when you're having a conversation, you're listening more than you're talking mm. or, else, or else you're just talking at someone, which is the risk of talking at technology. Yeah. But um, listen yeah you feel is it working mm. am i helping if it's not helping then don't do it stop and think about it again but deeply thinking about listening to others and who you want to hear from and often those people won't have a voice mm. so you have to give people a voice and and, and seek feedback all the time mm. changing 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 iterate little bits at a time in order to Find your a place for yourself to listen in order to speak. I love it. Tim, do you have anything else to add? Yeah, I mean, I'd just say quickly, you know, um, in the latest B Corps assessment, um, I, so I just recertified, you, you have to, it, it challenges you to say, were there any unintended consequences of you trying to do good? 
So I think just mapping out your impact and, and like as a solid example, you know, at Kilmanic Enterprises, we we occasionally have a challenge where some of our staff members will be on a government benefit. And if we pay them too much money, they lose their benefit. So we could pay them money, but it would mean at more money, but they'd actually be worse off. And so that's a very intentional thing where we have to work with each individual to go, OK, how do we maximize the money we can give you, but not at the detriment? to what you're already getting in terms of assisted living or, or maybe a health benefit um, or so on and so forth. So start, but track your impact and be and exactly like Kara saying, like, listen, be aware, be empathetic and just make sure that you're not doing any unintended damage through doing your good. I think that's the key thing. Right. Well, uh, I feel completely nourished uh, by this conversation. Uh, I, I, I guess I like to thank you uh, all four because I, one thing, participants, that, that you may not have uh, kind of observed, but actually uh, our experts are giving their time and they're giving it because there's a feeling of doing good. Well, at least that's my assumption, uh, <laughs> ladies and gents, is that you're here because there's a feeling of doing good and, and that you think by having this conversation and participating in, in the Emerging Futures Summit, you might just change the world a little bit better for the good. That's right. 100%. And yeah. if anything, I'm grateful that there's a generation, there's you know hundreds of, of students out there that care enough to sign up for this course to want to do good. You know, mm. me giving up an hour of my evening is inconsequential to the impact that everyone that's listening to here, the collective impact that you're all going to have is, yeah, you know, that's what we need. And that's cool. All right. Well, uh, I think we're going to wrap it there. Thank you again, uh, everyone. Uh, Jesse, Phil, Carol, and Tim, fantastic. Thank you, participants, for tuning in. Uh, we are going to have the video up on the website uh, with an opportunity to ask the experts some questions, which uh, we'll hopefully loop back in over the, the coming days. Uh, thanks again, and we look forward to seeing you tomorrow uh, with the next panel. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye.